So a good afternoon to everybody who's taken the time to tune into the seminar and a special welcome to my colleagues in South Africa who's joined us as well. Appreciation to the team in the international office, the IEA office, for not only arranging these web seminars, but for also hosting the fellows program in such an excellent way. And we will get to the thanks, et cetera, later, but the ladies, as I call them, of the IEA office have been remarkable um, under the leadership of Atme Le Franck. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for all that you've done for us. So today I'm going to talk to you about electroanalytical protocols as on the one hand, early warning systems, as well as profiling tools in the context of emerging contaminants. And you'll notice that I said it would be a long couple because of the two steps forward, one step out of life. But in fact, it applies to ancestors of today being treated with dark style. My affiliation, those of you who don't know where it is, in the open episode, most of the African towns, you have the University of Western Cape, a town called Dalgo. It's an image, it's an enclosed campus, that means it's not part of a village or any support economic structure, it's a university campus on its own. It's famous for our indigenous growth in the Western Cape, which is called Fainbos, and you'll see that we have a Cape Flats nature reserve where this is, um, where students are able to access and also visitors. And uh, sometimes we have some small mammals passing through on the uh, channels as they move around the Western Cape. And the university initiative, we open it is available to the public and to students as photo walks where they can take pictures and share that uh, to promote awareness. Our university follows the Commonwealth system or the uh, previously uh, countries who were previously Commonwealth uh, countries in terms of our governing structure in that we have a vice chancellor as our executive head in the person of Professor Tyrone Pretorius, ably assisted by a team um, at the moment, this is also a change. Formerly, we only had one, but the portfolio has been diversified um, of deputy vice chancellors in charge of academic, student development and support. And our research um, falls within the domain of research and innovation. Um, so we report directly to the DBT in that area. The um, head of the university, of course, is the chancellor, and in our case, the chancellor is the uh, Archbishop of the Anglican Church in South Africa. So formerly you may recognize Archbishop Desmond Tutu and currently we have Archbishop Pavel Makova as our Chancellor for the University of the West. The University is on campus and I thought I'd show you something of our new chemistry building, chemical sciences as we call it. It's a four-story building which houses quite modern laboratories and in the, in, the, in the area of electrochemistry state-of-the-art equipment. The building on the right of on your screen, the red building, is typically where visiting students and, and can stay for short stay visits. It's a self-catering residence. But as you can see, the atmosphere on campus is rather friendly, it's relaxed, there's good integration amongst people, opportunities and facilities, you know, for networking and for getting to know each other. So it's a very friendly campus. It's also a very green campus and it's won the award for the greenest campus on the African continent for a number of years in succession. In terms of our academic programs, uh, the university's academic programs are divided into seven faculties as you see them represented and chemistry falls within the Faculty of Natural Science. I must comment at this point that our offerings in terms of degree programs and honors programs, so a standalone fourth year program, master's programs and PhD programs across faculties are very discipline specific. We don't have at this point the interdisciplinary approach where you could do subjects in mathematics as well as subjects in chemistry and arts, for instance. The sciences are covered in the sciences programs and there you can have some overlap between departments, but for instance, not between natural sciences and languages or economics and management. So the disciplines are very specialized in terms of the program offerings. I want to move quickly in terms of our introduction to my laboratory, which is called Sensor Lab. Sensor Lab was founded um, around 2000, 2001 
by Professor Emmanuel de Hua, who is currently also the director of Sensor Lab. And as you can see, he is, or has been for a while, a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, is a chartered chemist, and he has a very senior profile both in the university and in the international science community. Uh, I have joined the university in 2003 and became co-leader of Sensor Lab in 2004. In terms of our activities to promote electrochemistry, I was elected to be the chairperson of our electrochemistry division of our science council, if you like, the South African Chemical Institute, which is the representing body for chemists and engineers in South Africa. And under the, wearing this hat, I've hosted a number of um, international conferences, and I have represented the country as well as the region on the uh, playing fields of the International Society of Electrochemistry, first as division head for electro uh, for analytical electrochemistry, and later on also as the engineer representative. So I mentioned this case because it speaks to our profile as Sensor Lab, as the University of the Western Cape, uh, in terms of our capacity to contribute and to share in the domain of electrochemistry. And, and the whole conversation today is going to be around electrochemistry and how it is useful to solve what we have identified as very current and topical issues. So you see some lovely people on the screen there and the, the, the team keeps growing and I had some difficulty putting all the faces in. But all of my colleagues there, Professor Nazim Javed, he's our Deputy Head of Department, Professor Fanel Wajai, um, Dr. Desfai Wario, Dr. Candice Branca, yes, that's a married surname, she changed it recently, uh, Dr. Francis Muya, Dr. Chinua Ikpo, uh, Dr. Keegan Pokbas, and Dr. Natasha Ross. Together, they each have their own speciality in terms of electrochemistry, but we joined our forces in terms of infrastructure and equipment so that we can advance our cause uh, more strongly. So what, uh, let me just go back one slide. You'll see on the left and right, I flanked two acronyms. The one is called NEST and the other one is ASPECT. NEST belongs to Professor Emmanuel, so not so much I will explain to you what is a soft chair so that applies. And to say that the, his site there is in the area of nanoelectrochemistry and sensor technology, and that he is already in his second wind of um, holding the chair, so much more experienced than I am. But I'm going to talk to you about what a chair is, so that you understand, first of all, and then a little bit about my own chair that I've just recently come into. So the South African Research Chairs Initiative was established in 2006 by the Department of Science and Technology, now known as the Department of Science and Innovation, um, and the National Research Foundation, which is our funding organization in South Africa. It is designed to attract and retain excellence in research and innovation in South Africa at public universities, and its main objectives, all of the activities are focused on expanding the scientific research and innovation capacity of South Africa, and creating research career pathways for young and mid-career researchers and also new recruits, you know, for them to see a trajectory, for them to see a future in science. And this is a very important establishment. And uh, in 2018, I was awarded, or yeah, the chair, um, Analytical Systems and Processes for Priority and Emerging Contaminants. So it's a competitive process. And in short, within the overarching and of what the South African Chairs Program wants to achieve, I would like to think that this chair specifically focusing, focuses on recognizing the advantages and instrumentation of electronics chairs and supplement what is classically available and what students are typically being trained. So, because the two go very uh, closely hand in hand, and then specifically electrochemical sensors for monitoring and evaluation. After this brief introduction of who we are, where we're located, and you know some of the acronyms and titles that you may not be familiar with outside of our um, South African context. I'm now going to move towards explaining a little bit more about what we understand as emerging contaminants, both from the EU perspective as well as the South African perspective. So in other words, what has been done, where are we, and why is it such a big problem? Uh, I've already talked about the research chair in initiative, and then I'm going to move straight into electrochemistry 
trying to show both the technique, how it looks like for people who may not be familiar with it, but then particularly focusing on two case studies where I would like to explore this uh, first of you, if you like, this John Myers. These are two steps forward, uh, representing the advantages and the achievements, and then one step back, still highlighting the challenges and drawbacks. Okay? And then we'll finish with some summary and discussion points. I heard someone's voice, so if I'm if I'm ignoring you, just make a louder noise, and then <laughs> I'm, I'm, I will just uh, answer the question. Okay, so emerging contaminants um, are synthetic or naturally occurring chemicals or any microorganisms that are commonly monitored that are not commonly monitored in the environment, but have the potential to enter the environment and cause suspected adverse ecological or human health effects. Now, this is a formal definition taken from a document uh, um, relating to the EU situation, and I will reference it later on. But I've broken it up into a little diagram so that you can see that it has to do in our, in my case specifically that I'm looking at, water. And whether it's groundwater, surf water, vegetable water, drinking water, etc., um, food processing, working and this problems. So what are we thinking about or, or uh, contaminants? We use the word contaminants. We're talking about pharmaceuticals, we're talking about antibiotics, we're talking about personal care products, we're talking about pesticides, we're talking about endocrine disrupting compounds. And there are lists available from the World Health Organization, there are lists available from just about every regulatory authority. So my intention is not to go through the list and tell you what should be there and what shouldn't, but just to provide some idea that in a country like South Africa, where we're focused and uh, presented with challenges in terms of certain ongoing diseases, uh, you know, in our populations because of the numbers and uh, limited access to treatment. Some pharmaceuticals, some chemical compounds may be more relevant than, for instance, in, in Europe or in any other place. So it's, the, it, you know, there is some room for discussion in terms of what point of departure of understanding what it is and where we're at in terms of the EU guidelines and the South African guidelines, and then what we can do to assist from the electrochemistry point of view. So the threat of, for emerging contaminants is the environmental and human toxicology of most of these compounds that has not yet been studied. So it's not well known, and therefore uh, strategies to minimize, to control, to eradicate are still also being developed. Many of these compounds are not or cannot be tested for in current municipal water systems or water treatment plants. However, when these contaminants, like your antibiotics, anti-epileptics, endocrine disrupting compounds, when they pass through the drinking water treatment system, which is the one that affects us most closely, byproducts are generated. And even these byproducts uh, cannot be screened for, cannot be monitored for, so that uh, we don't have a clear understanding of how much it is, of it is coming through always. Again, some countries are better than others, um, or exactly the quantities and the, and the effects. So let's start from the EU perspective. You know that you have the United Nations as a watchdog um, over in education, science and culture in, in Europe and in the world at, at large. And so they recognize that scientific knowledge, this is a statement by UNESCO uh, in the document that's referenced there, that scientific knowledge and understanding on potential and ecosystem health risks. And that they fund particular interventions in terms of international initiatives on water quality, that's just one example. Initiatives to strengthen member state participation, to improve knowledge, to improve technical skill, so that the health risk and the environmental risk caused by these emerging pollutants can in fact be understood. And this is towards attaining the 2030 uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, which is what they are currently working on. In terms of policies in, and regulations in Europe, um, you have the European Union has a number of policy documents, which they call directives. And so there are directives, as you can see, listed there that are both old and newer. 
However, the point that I'm trying to make is that these directives is what informs the water framework that governs uh, what is allowed for consumption in the EU. And so the European Environmental Agency considers this series of directives to be the overarching mechanism for addressing the wider impact of emerging concerns on the aquatic environment. And that's your starting point in every one this education groups as you for later. Global policies and from the point of view of Europe. The EU water framework was updated in 2000, so all already 20 years ago, to include a list of 33 priority substances such as metals, pesticides, etc., and endocrine disrupting compounds. The report that I'm referencing is the United Nations Environment Programme report listed at the bottom there. When we look at international frameworks, we're still talking about the Basel Convention, the Rotterdam Convention, and, and you know, the Stockholm Convention, and look at the dates of these conventions that apply to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals that we want to achieve uh, you know, in the international context. I'll talk about the Sustainable Development Goals also from a South African point of view, because you know, we'll, that will be our second position. So when we're talking about the sustainable development goals, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all, ensuring sustainable management of water and sanitation, the documents that inform these discussions and policies and frameworks and directives, um, you know, to use the technology on the Look at this in context, you know, not just to have words and the law thrown at us. Look at something like diclofenac, which we all know if we have uh, sore muscles, for instance, we use diclofenac as tablets, as gels, as suppositories. And also in, agri in agriculture for animals, they are vaccinated to protect them against various infections. And so in the same document, uh, so the EU report, diclofenac, we know is a therefore a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for these purposes. It has been found from studies that have been done in the EU in groundwater, surface water, drinking water, at weighted average concentrations exceeding what they call predicted no effect concentrations. So in other words, before, um, you know, or, or at the onset of adverse effects, so at low levels. In India and Pakistan, mass die-offs of vultures um, have been observed and reported as a result of infection, contamination, accumulation of time of water. not well removed from the water treatment processes. And so in some countries, there is a ban on diclofenac. For instance, here in Paris, I could not buy my diclofenac for when my knee gets uh, a little bit painful. But in South Africa, you can buy it over the counter. And this serves to illustrate that though you have guidelines for of certain countries, and I don't want to at this point differentiate first world and third world, as you will see, it will differ in terms of the progress that has been made in specific areas. But in the EU, um, a watch list on emerging contaminants in groundwater has included beta estradiols, uh, you know, so the endocrine disrupting compounds, as well as diclofenac. And now you need certification from a, a, a physician in order to be able to buy these things. What is the situation in South Africa? South Africa, we have what we call the South Africa National Standard Guidelines, and we have them for drinking water, in water, etc. And I'm just referring here to the code that you see there, SANS 241. Uh, that's the guidelines for drinking water. In South Africa, monitoring of the SANS determinants, as they call it, so the chemical composition of the water, what should be allowed and what not, is based on the view that few chemical determinants cause. Uh, you know, adverse health problems resulting from single exposure, except maybe through massive accidental contact, so if you have a spill or a major event. So they're saying that the implied risk, or rather that there isn't a, a, a risk from uh, chemical compounds to such an extent that it has to be listed yet. We're getting there. At the moment, we're, we just have the view that few chemicals can lead to death or severe effects. 
The implied risk, of course, is that cumulative exposure of, of over time of contaminants is being ignored. So we're only looking at uh, acute exposure and not chronic exposure. And as you know, a lot of these compounds that we know as uh, emerging threats in this context uh, is an emerging of chronic exposure and accumulation over time. And so it's a silent and often lethal threat. The measurements of physical properties of water is detailed in SANS and links the quality of water to odor and appearance. That's what makes it good drinking water. A lot of our SANS water quality standards are based on probe methods and optical detection. So with UV spectroscopy, yeah. Um, and yet there has been cases where uh, outbreaks have been monitored and reported uh, as acute exposures, so, so case studies. In South Africa, to address this area of lack, this area of research to inform changes in guidelines, and with that, I, I want to say that, of course, it's a lengthy process. It's not something that happens overnight, and it involves many role players. The Water Research Commission was established in terms of the Water Research Act of South Africa to look at this lack of research capacity, the lack of knowledge of what is our, our threats from water, or what are the threats that we should be looking out for in water, and how things are changing over time. The Water Research Commission has an international component to it, so that they are up to date and in touch with what's happening globally. And in this context, they continue to fund as one of the seed group members of the Knowledge Hub of EU program, such as the Joint Program Initiative of the EU on uh, aqua pollution. Um, and Sensor Lab has responded this year to a joint call with European partners to address some of these issues of emerging contam contaminants. And diclofenac, for instance, is one of those that we want to evaluate in this international context because in Europe it has already been you know, removed and placed on a be careful list, whereas in South Africa not. And so we need to look at um, the differences in terms of sampling, in terms of quantification, in terms of profiling over time. And that is our, our intention there. I took the opportunity to also look at some of the Water uh, Research Commission's reports on emerging contaminants. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything. And if I could just briefly summarize all these reports, you will notice that the uh, message, message is I don't have the enough skilled people, we don't have enough knowledge about the technique that required to be able to monitor and report accurately, to base um, recommendations on, to base guidelines on, and to change eventually legislation. A lot of analytics in South Africa still relies on high performance uh, liquid chromatography coupled to various uh, um, uh, the word I'm looking for, concentration, so like solid phase extraction of the analyte in the sample before analysis, or in fact, different analytical um, uh, detectors, you know, to, to enhance uh, separation detection resolution and so on. And it's not a bad, uh, a bad method. I'm not shooting HPLC. I'm saying that with all that has been done using the classical methods, there is still room for speciation studies, specific contaminants that are slipping through that we need to address in terms of being able to monitor them and to be, being able to quantify them. So the reports are there and we can share them. Um, the idea is that I'm trying to share with this report that there's still a lack of knowledge, still a lack of skilled uh, personnel. And so within the context both of the research chair, these are the national objectives, our strategic development board, these are the areas that we should be addressing all of our research. And I'm going to uh, just give you a very brief introduction to electrochemistry just as a basis for this discussion. I'm not um, presupposing that people are not familiar with electrochemistry, but I think it's, it's necessary for us to, to be on the same page. And when I introduce electrochemistry, I always say all of us can identify with at least one of those pictures. If it's not the radical breakdown, the oxidative radicals breaking down our cell structure to age us, then it's the oxidation process that improves the, you know, the phenolics conversions to the quinones, et cetera, in our red wines to improve the taste. 
or a cherished vehicle that we've left out and we've seen the effects of oxidation or just, you know, apples that we've eaten, bananas that have been oxidized. And by oxidized, we understand from first principles, you know, the loss of electron, substation or the gain of electron, which is reduction. And in fact, this is electric energy in its simplest form, it needs a system that can shuffle these electrons. When the system can shuffle electrons or has the ability to be energized so that its electrons move, so we disturb it from rest in such a way that there is electron transfer. There is also a way to use electrochemistry when there's not transfer but just excitation. For today, I want to just talk simple case. I'm going to talk electron transfer. We can choose with our instruments to ramp a certain potential window so we can choose a direction from negative to positive. And as we systematically increase the potential, we're moving oxidatively. And we can switch that ramp to a reduction ramp and produce a reduction wave. Now, this is a very simple model for perfect, reversible, one electron transfer. And typically, it yields a little graph like that, where we can get information about quantity, intensity, if you like, from the signal that we choose to measure. And I've shown here current as a function of potential. And we can use potential as an indicator of identity. And yes, we still refer to the standard redox potentials, or we use internal standards to verify identity. And first university requires typically for our analysis where you have to work done and you measure the current that is generated at the counter electrode. Now that looks like in real life uh, some glass jar with three electrodes in it, and you, you've all seen electrodes in various formats. In our lab, uh, the electrochemical workstations looks uh, a little bit like that, where all the electronic control is done by computer, and this is of small volumes, typically between 3 to 5, not more than 10 milliliters. Concentrations that we work with are in the micromolar to nanomolar, and this is ideal for environmental analysis. Of course, the electrodes that have to be, that we work with in some cases have to be modified. So they have a conductive surface indicated by the shiny bits here, the little circles in the middle. And that's typically either gold or, or platinum um, or uh, other metals nowadays. You can also have thin electrodes and modify them or also carbon. And even more modern, I guess, even more portable, even more easy to use is these little handheld potential stats. And, these little handheld potential stats, I'm not getting any commission from anyone for saying this, but they do improve the portability. They do improve the user friendliness of electrochemistry as a technique. They don't help a layman to know electrochemistry. They can use the tool for application. And that's an important point to consider. So we move away from the lab to these printed electrodes and we can make them highly customized. And these printed electrodes, again, no commission, uh, are compatible with these devices that literally can fit into a lady's handbag, into a woman's briefcase, and be taken to a site for fairly sensitive, well, I should say, I say fairly because the sensitivity selectivity is the matter that the research is developing. But the idea is that it is for highly sensitive and selective measurement. <clears throat> so how do we make these simple electrodes, these simple tools that everyone can use how do we make them special? In other words, how do we make them discriminate between species? How do we make them discriminate between oxidation states? How do we make them discriminate between metabolites as a function, uh, as opposed to uh, uncatalyzed or unmetabolized uh, starting material? There are a number of approaches, of course, that we have to adopt. And the first one is that materials engineering. And in materials engineering, the in Intention is to design high surface area materials. We know again from first principles that reactivity of reactions <clears throat> are linked or is linked to contact, first of all. And <clears throat> if there is no contact, there's no chemical reaction. And if you can increase the possibility for contact uh, between the surface that drives the work and where the work has to be done, 
then we need nanostructured or, or high surface area materials. And we can do this in a number of ways, and I'll show some examples. In the slide here, I've shown a hydrogel, which is in our case a cross link between two polymers, and it forms a porous structure, so a high surface area that can swell in water, but that retains its structure and doesn't dissolve. In the second picture, I show PAA, polyamic acid, which is the polymer. In other words, single murmur connected repetitively and able to constantly when it moves. And the last picture, how we can improve the surface area even further, of course, is working with the same polymers you see in the second picture, but now spinning it, stretching it out to make even thinner, more fibrous structures to increase the surface area. So uh, let me leave that for materials now. I'll talk a little bit more about the different well, two examples that I've highlighted for this talk of materials. I don't want to focus only on materials, but I do want to say that a lot of our collaboration with new labs outside of our main interest of chemistry um, is to develop new materials, both from biology, from biology so both organic materials um, or synthetic materials, uh, analogs of real enzymes, etc. There are a number of approaches that we adopt for materials. The second way, okay. The second way in which we can make electrochemistry special is by fine tuning the signal that we have available through our electrochemical equipment to do the actual investigation. Lastly, of course, uh, more recently, uh, people, electrochemists, chemists in general, have moved towards coupling techniques so that you harness the advantages of more than one. And especially spectroscopy has been very um, very desirable in this context so that you can do light emission, light absorption studies, absorbance, uh, UV absorbance, fluorescence, etc., and couple that to electrochemistry or um, also FTIR. We have these facilities in our lab so that we can extend ability to understand, to see what's happening step by step as a function of synthesis, as a function of reaction, etc. I thought to just highlight in this context so that you don't think that we're doing uh, maverick science all out on our own. This example from um, MIT, which was recently published in, in science, where they, in fact they adopt a very similar approach. So they looked at, um, you know, photocatalysis as part of organic synthesis. How can they do it cleaner? How can they have more control over the redox reaction? How can they minimize transition metal photocatalyst both both in terms of waste and in terms of it being spent and not being regenerated, et cetera. So in slide A, you know, we demonstrate this point for the past electrochemistry. I think it's not a electrochemistry, electrochemistry, so you can by controlling, that's what slide the, the, the little cartoon A and oh, sorry B and C is all about. C refers to the example that they've mentioned here. But I would like to show here how they use spectroelectrochemistry to study the lifetime of the radical. So by coupling your spectroscopy with your electrochemistry, not only can you generate and allow reaction to happen, but you can monitor. You can monitor decay times. You can see exactly when coupling has taken place. So the, the duration of your reaction, you don't have to guess and hope. Uh, you know, in the old days, we used to say, tell the students, look for the color change. It's not everything at a very small scale where you can see the color change. So we need to have spectroscopic uh, tools that will be able to indicate this. And then, of course, they've done this experiment as a function of distance between the electrodes. Because the challenge was efficient coupling. And by work, uh, playing around with the distance between electrodes, uh, they were able to optimize um, the distance for generating the individual radicals to produce efficient coupling. The platform that they use is called a microfluidic system. I don't want to really talk about that, but it's an even smaller cell than anything I've shown you in pictures up until now. And it really relies on capillary reaction for movement of solvents, and it allows spacing of up to micrometers of electrodes apart. And so when they show results like this micrometer distance, it's possible with microfluidic cells. More of that because it's not our work. 
presenting, you know, the, the paper as a snapshot for context, so that uh, I don't create the impression that we're the only ones who want to do this kind of thing. So, South African national directives, we've talked about them. The two important things, just as in Europe, the similarity, I should say, was the need for early warning systems and the need for effective treatment technologies. And early learning systems we define as the ability to measure at that level of concentration before effect, you know, negative effect, before adverse effect or disease or whatever the, the, the crisis is that we want to, to link the contaminant to before that event happens. And if I can just perhaps use a little graph to show it better, Early warning measurement takes place in this domain, very low concentration uh, before the onset of event. We've defined that term before. And so you need tools that are highly specific because as we know, at low concentrations, interference plays a big role. Uh, signal to noise resolution is very important. So all of these things we have to start thinking about when we say that we can use electroanalytical to address the issue of early warning. Early warning has to be constituting a the time and announce the event, the rapidity of the response. One can also refer to um, measurement as an early warning system. We've already said that um, conventional water treatment uh, technologies are not effective, so our municipal systems, both here, um, when I say here, I'm in Europe, unfortunately, today, and also for us in South Africa, uh, you know, all water treatment systems have this problem that some of these contaminants are slipping through. So now I'm going to move very quickly to two uh, case studies of results from our own work to showcase these points in terms of advantages and disadvantages. So now we're moving to the dance, the two steps forward, one step back. In the first case study I'd like to focus on in the context of uh, emerging contaminants, not just making it about pharmaceuticals. There are also others, even metals are considered emerging contaminants of concern when it comes to the, new, the, the way that we use nanomaterials now and uh, the rate at which it is being actually ingested into, uh, you know, by people and animals for that matter. So let's look a little bit quickly at polyaromatic hydrocarbons just to refresh our minds. These are contaminants uh, or compounds, what do you want to say? Compounds. Um, carbon and hydrogen they are atrophs. Non-polar molecule found in coal. Why do people to measure them from their position of rest? So either you're going to measure them by affinity, um, you know, adsorption affinity, ion exchange affinity, but we're not going to be able to get them to open up within the window of potential that we classically work with in electroanalytical, which is with most of the available electrodes today, typically between minus 1.5 volts, as with respect to the silver silver chloride as a reference electrode, to plus 1.5. So it's not a very wide window. It's certainly not three volts or two volts, as may be required to open up the ring structure of a polyaromatic hydrocarbon. So how do we deal with these compounds in solution when we want to apply analytical protocols? Polyaromatics undergo metabolic activation to form diol epoxide, which bound covalently to the DNA, and I'm trying to show that. And these adducts are the precursors to uh, carcinogenesis, uh, so cancer-forming cells. And the rate at which the adducts are formed exceed the rate at which antibodies are produced when we speak of cancer in the, in the broader sense. Yes, I'm not talking about any particular kind, just how these polyaromatics into the field of our bodies to force Some of the approaches that we adopted for that, you will not find the find a person. You will find one of the aspects of the two categories. 
is the ability to make more than one of them in one song. A multi array approach, and you have multiple electrodes, each fashioned to be sensitive to its own uh, individual polyaromatic hydrocarbon. You pass a sample containing a mixture over these electrodes, and the idea is that by individual stimulation of the uh, electrode surface and by materials design, you are able to selectively measure one of these polyaromatics in, uh, in the mixture. So a very ambitious <laughs> objective in every sense. Uh, you know, we've, we've totally moved away in this particular case study from single electrode, single ion detection, differentiating it from another one. Just if you were taking an environmental sample, the real problem uh, and now notwithstanding matrix effects or interference, because that's a secondary matter to look at, the approach, the protocol should be based on the ability to screen for the presence of. And so in this study, we successfully designed uh, some novel polymer in collaboration with the colleagues here at LPPI at, um, the, uh, what is the new one? name? CY Paris Sergi University. <laughs> I'm, I'm very familiar with the University Sergi Pontoise. Um, and so what I'm showing there on the right is how we utilize the advantages of electricity that I highlighted before, to study the surface morphology, to study the topography, to study before and after analysis to investigate mechanism. Is it absorption? Is there a lasting residue? Is our electrode being contaminated, fouled as we call it? And when does it become useless as opposed to useful? By adopting this combination strategy of one, novel materials design, two, analytical support for characterization, three, blue sky thinking, as we called it at one point in South Africa in terms of the big problem and how to solve the big problem, we were in fact able to find some resolution for uh, benzo a pyrene as opposed to fluoranthine and one hydroxypyrene in the same mixture. I'm not sure if you can see my slide, my screen is slightly blocked. Slight differentiation in potential, but certainly differentiation in selectivity and sensitivity of response. I'm not going to talk about the mechanism here, this is the shape of the curve, which indicates some absorption competing with the electrochemical mechanism. All I'm trying to show is that in this very uh, blue sky, very bold approach to say, can we monitor? The answer was yes, we can successfully use specific electrocatalysts, so the materials design, to, and, and this can be electrosynthesized in situ, so we don't have to go to the lab and do um, big pot synthesis and then transfer. We can generate these materials on the electrode surface and we can apply them. But the disadvantage, of course, um, oops, is still that we, in mixtures, we don't get a reliable result. So the results that I've shown is for single component at a single electrode. But when we go to mixtures, you still have challenges of discrimination. And this is because of the very close structural identity and the very close chemical property. Now there are ways to deal with that. And the one that I'm going to show you may not be the first intuitive one that you would think of. Uh, to solve that problem, but I'm working systematically so that at the end of the day, you have an overview of the diversity of strategies that we can employ. I'm going to use the opportunity to talk about how molecularly imprinted polymers, for instance, can be used to move one step forward again. So we use pearl and we synthesize pearl in situ at the electrode surface in the presence of the target that you want to determine. So your target is entrapped in your polymer interface. You then wash the target out and use the templated, the imprinted polymer to detect the template very specifically. And the idea behind imprinted electrodes is in fact that that template will only recognize in terms of stereo, in terms of charge, in shape and size, the imprint. So we saw some results with that. We got very good sensitivity for the templated molecule and its respective elements as well. But what if we take for analog, slightly different 
geometric configuration like Chrysin, is the imprinted electrode still able to perform at the level of sensitivity and selectivity required? And we saw that we did. In fact, if you look at the numbers just indicating sensitivity of response, they were very close. So in this case, you now have your pyrene in the presence of Chrysin and your template is selectively reporting uh, pyrene. And so this supports the view that the imprinted technology is able to give you that specificity when it is implied. So now I can go back and say, okay, who wants it? We use this new knowledge now to go forward. When we design arrays going forward, when we want to revisit this problem, we can now say, let's look at molecularly imprinted polymers and again, find the best polymer to do the work because that's another area that we can investigate and align them in an array system to do the uh, combined matrix analysis. And perhaps this will yield better results. Perhaps there are also other strategies that can be adopted and uh, we will look at them shortly. So in the second case study that I want to talk about, I'm going to highlight the case for antibiotics so that we can move to the biosensing side of, of things because in electrochemistry, biosensors is also a major area of, uh, of research and of course of application. In the context of antibiotics, I'm going to talk about sulfonamides um, as an emerging threat. There are many of them, as you can see in the bar chart on the right-hand side. These have been documented in terms of quantities and effect in South Africa, and there is even some EU legislation for the levels that should be, should be measured. Remember, again, we're talking early warning signals, so we want to be measuring in the lower parts of the and lower as is reliably possible. When you go lower, there is the issue of reliability um, in terms of the, you know, detection ability. Now, I'm, I, I do trust that you can see my screen nice and clearly because there is the stru general structure of sulfonamides on the right-hand corner. Um, and we know that sulfonamides is one of the that uh, uh, prescribes antibiotics. A sulfonamide drug, not necessarily an antibiotic, is an antibiotic when it has the amine in position for, that's what distinguishes it. But in the context of the, the talk, the sulfonamide drugs have been used widely as antifungal <clears throat> properties, anti-malarial. Um, there is the risk of, I, I want to use the word comorbidity, uh, and that may just be because of the current COVID uh, um, atmosphere, but there is the risk of hypersensitivity in some, in some people, in some patients, especially in patients with HIV. And so in South Africa, of course, this is a big uh, concern. So that when doctors prescribe sulfonamides, it makes the patient more sensitive to, to, to sunlight, for instance, and you run the risk of skin cancers and skin irritation. Will make a different uh, antibiotic. Excuse me. But the common position four, of course, is the reactivity that makes it, you know, gives it its uh, stereochemical and functional identity as an antibiotic. Um, so again, we took the approach of using polymer electrodes. You will notice I'm not yet in the domain of biosensing, polymer electrodes. We got very, very, very good response. So if you look at the calibration curve, wide linear range, very small error bars for detecting these sulfonamides through their common sulfonamide moiety. So just below the R substitution, position one identification, not R identification. And what one wants to move to if you want to do specificity of, of uh, detection is of course being able to not only identify sulfonamide, but also the R group. And so we are working on that in the background. Um, so again, we say that we rely on various sulfonides as a cross-specific detection, of individual detection, in the range of opening signals. Um, and so we moved forward in that aspect, but of course, in terms of specificity, we're all reporting at the sulfonamide functionality and not the specificity of a particular drug that has been prescribed for uh, AIDS patients or eye inflammations or animal in, animals in agriculture. But we don't know 
source, we can't relate source and effect. We can just say that, yes, there is anti uh, sulfonamide antibody. When one gets to this point in electroanalysis, we now turn to the use of biomolecules in its diversity for that specificity and selectivity. So what we do is we harness the natural ability of biomolecules to perform their function in the metabolic pathway. Highly specific, highly reliable, uh, I can transfer that electro surface. And, and reproduce in the uh, environmental or in the laboratory cell the same with enzymes like glucose, oxidase, tyrosinase. They can have multiple substrates. Um, some, you know, the, the, if it's not the preferred substrate, then usually you lose a little bit of sensitivity. You can also work with enzymes through inhibition pathways rather than catalysis pathways. Uh, so there again, you know, enzymes is the domain of biochemistry. It requires partnerships. There's a wealth of information. And this talk is certainly not meant to introduce biosensors in its totality, but simply to say to you that in developing electroanalytical protocols, biosensors is another option. In the case of sulfonamides, how did we approach it? We said that the uh, enzyme that is involved in sul with sulfonamides in nature is the enzyme involved in the folic acid pathway. Now, I'll talk about uh, the mechanism in a minute. But what is folate? Humans don't have the ability to synthesize our own folate. We get it from some of the B vitamins, we get it from our food, but bacteria can. And bacteria use an enzyme called dihydropteroate synthase to complete the folic acid synthesis pathway. Now, the enzyme is a synthase, which means it synthesizes something from a substrate into something new. And in the case of uh, the folic acid synthesis, uh, synthesis pathway, it requires dihydropteroate pyrophosphate, which is indicated with the two little red peas over there. And this in turn is generated from dihydropteroate through a kinase using adenosine triphosphate. So this is, happens naturally. Up until this process, we were okay. But when we try to buy hydropteroid synthase, it's not an ultimate. You know, you grow the cells, extract the purify it. It's totally with outside of the domain of the chemists, of the electrochemists. And so we adopted in our approach a substitute substrate. We said, let's buy something that is commercially available that has the pyrophosphate. And we looked at thiamine pyrophosphate, so a smaller body, but with a pyrophosphate moiety. And we subjected it to uh, the, the synthase enzyme in the presence of para-aminobenzoic acid, the natural substrate. So the synthase works in an SN2 mechanism, so a substitution nucleophilic, uh, to replace the, the pyrophosphate functionality with the PABA through the N4. Now you can see why it's not all sulfur drugs that will inter interfere, but only the antibiotics, because the antibiotics have this position for amine group. And so if you put a sulfonamide in solution here, the sulfonamide will bind to your phosphatase substrate to generate a, a, a precursor to folic acid synthesis that won't work. So the folic acid synthesis uh, pathway is inhibited. I think it's called a bacteriostatic effect rather than a bactericidal. It doesn't kill the bacterium, but it stops the pathway. And this for us was immensely interesting because number one, you cannot immobilize a synthase enzyme on an electrode. So this is solution work. Number two, if it is bacteriostatic and not bacteriocidal, it means that the patient could also reduce in nature. And all of these factors one must consider in the context of that, um, uh, uh, antibiotic resistance in the long term. We spoke about earlier when uh, we looked at the EU guidelines and the South African contaminants of emerging concern, emerging pollutant, they come by different names, but also the metabolic pathway is important 
to understand it all. So this is again by no means uh, intended to follow all of the biochemistry or the science, but to make the point that there is a need for understanding, not just in situ, in the moment, but also the before and the after chemistry of what's happening when we design sensors. So yes, we took this crazy approach. We controlled enzyme concentration, substrate concentration, inhibitor concentration, and we got some very good results. And play substrate and the different antibodies um, that we had actually showed this inhibition effectively and could reduce complication. This has perhaps not been the best example to talk about biosensors. So what we do now slowly close off with is the more well understood approach of biosensors in the broader context. So that as a global community, when we strategize about solutions, we're not only aware of the two small examples that we've adopted and, and tried in the lab and the approaches that I've tried to highlight through that work, but also what is available um, you know, to us as a global community in order to tap into that. So, a biosensor is nothing more than a chemical sensor functionalized with a bio element at the end of it. So you apply the, the potential, the work is done at the transducer, an electron is transferred to a bio element. The bio element then one would like to think behaves true to its nature and does what it would normally do um, you know, in, in nature, in the human body or in nature. And let's talk about that. Enzyme biosensors require a substrate and they typically catalyze a substrate. So in the top strategy of the enzyme block, we show how a mediator can be used, something with fast electrochemistry, so fast electron transfer ability to quickly get the electrode to the enzyme, and in some cases, even infiltrate the protein structure of the enzyme to get to the core where electron transfer does um, or is involved in the work to be done. So there are two different strategies. And as I mentioned before, it's not only catalysis with enzymes, but also the inhibition effects that can be used for quantification. A second approach uh, to biosensors is that of DNA, where the parent DNA or the probe DNA can be immobilized on an electrode surface. And in solution, the complementary strand will bind to it. This is its natural behavior. And so we can measure that directly uh, using some of the, um, remember I said that we can generate signals in electrochemistry in different ways, or we can use an, a reporter. We can use, again, something that is read, has fast redox and study its behavior as an indirect probe of the binding. Furthermore, we can use antibodies in the design of biosensors. So antibodies, typically we call these immunosensors. But antibodies we understand in the context of ELISA, and they have many different ways of interacting, either directly with the antigen or through the antigen with another antibody, a labeled antibody, et cetera. So we talk about uh, sandwich ELISA, for instance. So when we understand the protocol of measuring a signal through its antibody antigen pair, again, we try to replicate this at the electrode surface. And there are many advantages and disadvantages, and I repeat that this is not intended to downplay the biosensors aspect of it, but just to inform you of strategies that should be explored in finding near-perfect solutions or perfect solutions. Lastly, we also use microbial biosensors uh, in the same way as I've explained before to design. So the microbial or whole cells are in solution, they can either be metabolized or uh, intoxicated, toxified by a species in solution. You can use a number of different signals to measure the rest of the quantitative response. At this point, it might be useful just to look at coronavirus and understand how we can perhaps use electroanalytical protocols to design sensors. So RNA virus, so each genome does consist of a DNA double strand. And so in this approach by the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science that recently was reported in the news, they use a highly sophisticated nanostructured glass interface where they put gold nano islands. And onto the gold nano islands, they took an extract of DNA. And these extracts were shorter base pair 
complement of the DNA is called an actomer. And they immobilize the actomer onto the gold island modified substrate. And that acted as the matching binding pair for the RNA. And in this way, they were able to generate signals of both uh, using uh, the plasmon resonance effect through the gold nanoparticles and also the heat produced by the binding reaction to confirm uh, re uh, a positive signal for testing positive for the presence of the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. So in summary, I've said a lot of different types of sensors. I've tried to show from our work just a few cases because the intention is to have us thinking broadly of electroanalytical protocols, the different ways that we can design them, the different materials, the different instruments, and how they can be used for effective low-level detection in the context of early warning devices. Uh, we recognize that materials engineering is a big part of it that electrochemical sensing protocols are compatible with conventional and highly sophisticated analytical tools. So it has a natural entry into the scientific community or the scientific market. And that there are numerous sensing strategies that can be developed. And we haven't even begun to explore the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but what these strategies do highlight as well is that multidisciplinary research groups have the better chance of developing successful outcomes. So internationalization, as was established through this program, uh, internationally funded programs to bring thinking minds from different backgrounds together, also at institutions forging multidisciplinary research is indeed advantageous in developing these protocols. And then maybe as a second last slide, not to forget that, there, that analytics is part of a bigger system and that we cannot ignore the holistic approach, and that we cannot just have measurement and results, but that the me measurement and results inform risk assessment, inform implementation measures, and there is a certain cycling. And only in time will it inform policies and guidelines. So the fact that we see guidelines dated in some markets, you know, the participation of science and of the global society. I think I've touched on a number of different issues in this broader context of developing electroanalytical protocols. Um, but, uh, I think I've said enough on that and we can perhaps open the conversation uh, a little bit wider. But before we do that, I just want to express again my appreciation to all of the funders and participants listed on the slide, in particular with students. You know, in South Africa, our research model is student-centered. Uh, we, as, as research or as professors, we are capacitated to help students to do research. So the knowledge transfer process is very important. Sometimes it impedes the you know, drive for results, but uh, it is important. And uh, so I do want to start by thanking all of the students, both in Sensor Lab and also at LPPI, the colleagues at Sensor Lab and LPPI who have supported our research, um, our funders, the various uh, funding organizations that are listed, and in particular, the International Research 